yes, the newfangled perpetual still save firewood and water in dispelling the spirits. But whiskey was on the minds and on the breath of millions of Americans back in the early 1800s for many bigger reasons. Imagine a 30-year national binge in which 9 million women and children downed 12 million gallons of the hard stuff every year and 3 million men averaging 60 million gallons. 1800 to 1830 in the old U.S. of A. If you remember it, you weren't there. A Colonel John Cook gave the crude case for whiskey consumption in 1806 to traveler Benjamin Latrobe, arguing that the settlers and pioneers especially in the woodlands had no means of happiness equal to what whiskey was to them. First, he said, there is always some dry corner under their dripping roofs, and if they get wet, whiskey keeps the cold out. Secondly, whiskey is better than a tight wall against a northwestern gale. Third, whiskey, Colonel Cook said, is a substitute for all solid food, and an hour's labor earns a day's drunkenness. Four, fighting is amusement, and all quarrels are made up over a glass of whiskey. Five, and most offensively, eaten wives find their comfort enough in whiskey, and horned husbands, according to Colonel Cook, besides the whiskey find pleasure in beating their wives. So, why else was whiskey so important, especially in the Upper Shenandoah Valley and Lower Shenandoah Valley? It was patriotic and profitable. The Lower Shenandoah Valley especially grew the corn better than anyone else near the eastern coast, the corn that went into whiskey. The Scotch-Irish, who specialized in distilling the spirits, tended to settle in this region, so they winked at boozing and filled their pockets with the profits from boozing. Moreover, the roads leading west crisscrossed this region, bringing tippling toppers to taverns. The farmer's corn, growing in the rich natural meadowlands of Berkeley, Jefferson, and Frederick counties, would be worth 150 to 500 percent more in the Georgetown and Alexandria markets in the form of whiskey in barrels compared to corn as grain. And if you had access to a competent coppersmith like Conrad Schindler in Shepherdstown, you could use your proceeds from your sales to buy yourself your own $300 still and make your profits more like the 500%. Above all, strange you'll say, but whiskey was American as apple pie, or rather, apple cider. No, it wasn't the frilly French stuff like wine, or mercy English tea. Whiskey had become the badge of American democracy. Tip a few and strike a blow for freedom, they would say. In fact, whiskey bought more votes than it did not at Election Day polls. Even the venerable great George Washington knew the necessity of giving whiskey to his voters when he ran for the House of Burgesses in his younger days. Horrible, but true. All this boozy madness came to a screeching halt in 1815 when peace came to war-torn Europe, the Europe that was buying all the surplus grain from the United States. Suddenly, the profits that were being plowed back in to drink were gone. By 1819, grain, foodstuffs, and whiskey were piling up on the docks of New Orleans and Philadelphia. There had been a grave oversupply. Even more grave because 
Whiskey had become the currency of the frontier. Whiskey had become the money, the means of exchange for everything else. And now there was a grave oversupply of not only whiskey, but the coin of the realm. There was an economic panic, and in its wake came the morning after, the great national sobering up, characterized by taxation on whiskey to limit its production levels, more regulation of the production of whiskey, which was made easier by the emergence of large centralized distilleries. And finally, by 1830, the beseechings of physicians like Benjamin Rush, pointing out the health hazards of drinking so much whiskey were finally being heard. And we saw the birth of the American Temperance Society. The party was over. <laughs>